Moscow's cookbook and speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Well, most football players never play in the Super Bowl, as you know. The same is true for other occupations that have their version of the Super Bowl. For lawyers, the Supreme Court of the United States is the Super Bowl. Everyone in law school reading those Supreme Court cases dreams of the day when they will stand before the Supreme Court of the United States arguing a case. Winning would be the ultimate dream, but just making it to that version of the Super Bowl separates you from more than 99% of lawyers who will never come close to presenting a case to the United States Supreme Court. Neil Katyal, who will join us tonight, has argued 50 cases to the United States Supreme Court, 50. That means, as I just said, Neil Katyal has written more Supreme Court briefs than I have read. And so I am more than eager to hear Neil Katyal's assessment of the briefs that have been submitted so far in the case of Donald J. Trump versus Norma Anderson et al. That is the name of the case that the Supreme Court will hear next Thursday, with Donald Trump appealing a decision by the Supreme Court of Colorado to ban Donald Trump from the presidential ballot in Colorado on the basis of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which bars anyone from holding federal office if they have betrayed an oath to uphold the Constitution. Today, the Board of Elections in Illinois decided that they don't have the authority to ban Donald Trump from the ballot. They followed the advice of a retired Republican judge on that point. In that judge's report to the Board of Elections, the judge said, the evidence presented at the hearing on January 26, 2024, proves by a preponderance of the evidence that President Trump engaged in insurrection within the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. That will be one of the questions that the Supreme Court will have to resolve. Did Donald Trump engage in an insurrection? Another question the Supreme Court will have to resolve is, does Section 3 of the 14th Amendment apply to Donald Trump? The first words of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment say, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office. The question for the Supreme Court is, does the word office apply to the presidency? Is there any reason to think that the offers of the office of the 14th Amendment would not allow a person to become a senator after engaging in insurrection or a member of the House of Representatives or even become an elector of a president, a member of the Electoral College? But did they intend to allow a participant in insurrection to become president? Another question before the Supreme Court will be, is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment what lawyers call self-executing? Congress never passed a law specifying a legal process for excluding someone 
from office on the basis of Section 3. But Donald Trump's lawyers have argued that it is impossible then to bar him from being on the ballot if he has not, at a minimum, been convicted of the crime of insurrection. Like many cases before the Supreme Court, the answers to the questions before the court lie in history. The Republican majority in the Supreme Court all become amateur historians in cases like this, as do their clerks. They go careening through history with the singular mission of finding ways of supporting conclusions they've already reached. The Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade is one of the low points of Supreme Court historical research. Justice Samuel Alito and his clerks decided to rely on the opinions of two English prosecutors, both of whom, presumably unbeknownst to Justice Alito, were very proud prosecutors of witches and strong advocates of the death penalty for witches 400 years ago, which one of them enforced as a judge. So the most important Supreme Court opinion of the 21st century relies on the thinking of two Englishmen who 400 years ago believed in and prosecuted witches urging that they be put to death. That's how bad the Supreme Court can be in its use and abuse of history. The ahistorical Alito side of the Supreme Court is facing a higher authority this time on history. This week, the Supreme Court received a brief in the, ca in the case from America's highest authorities on the history of the 14th Amendment. Jill Lepore, professor of history at Harvard University. David Blight, professor of history and African American studies at Yale University. Drew Gilpin Faust, a historian and former president of Harvard University, who is now a Harvard University professor. And John Fabian Witt, professor of law at Yale Law School. If I can recommend one Supreme Court brief for you to read in your life, let it be this one because it is relatively short at 34 pages with plenty of white space. It is clearly written, as clearly written as a Supreme Court brief can possibly be, because it doesn't rely on the technicalities of law. The four professors who contributed to this brief are all authors of beautifully written books, easy to read books. This is the kind of brief that high school students could easily read, have no challenges reading this. You have, if you have a junior high school student at home who hopes to maybe go to law school someday, or just as a bright junior high school student, this is great reading, great reading for those students. They will have no challenges comprehending any of this. This brief sets up to convince the Supreme Court of this proposition on page four. Its framers intended Section 3, one, to automatically disqualify insurrectionists, two, to apply not only to the Civil War, but also to future insurrections, and three, to bar anyone who has betrayed an oath to uphold the Constitution from becoming President of the United States. As to Section 3 applying to future insurrections, the answer to that is on page three of the brief, quoting Senator Benjamin Butler in the debate on the 14th Amendment saying, this is to go into our Constitution and to stand to govern future insurrection as well as the present. The brief tells the story of how the 14th Amendment prevented Jefferson Davis, the President of the Confederate States of America, from even attempting to run for the Senate or run for the presidency of the United States after the Civil War. The brief tells the story of members of the Confederacy who were barred from holding federal office automatically and without trial. Quote, when the Democrat Alexander H. Stevens, the former vice president of the Confederacy, was elected to the U.S. Senate, the clerk of Congress refused to call the names of the ex-Confederates at roll and they were never seated. Simple as that. Before drafting the 14th Amendment, a special joint committee of Congress heard testimony from 145 witnesses. The brief, the historian's brief prevent, presents the testimony of J.W. Alvord, who was questions about the conditions he found in the southern states.
question. Now, state what among the rebel people is the general feeling towards the government of the United States? Answer, it is hostile, as it seems to me in the great majority of the Southern people, I mean that part of them who were engaged in the rebellion. There is evidently no regret for the rebellion, but rather a defense of it. Question, what great object do they seem to contemplate in their being readmitted to Congress by their senators and representatives? Answer, they seem to suppose that by readmission, they can get political power and obtain again the supremacy which they once had. And with the exception of slavery, they expect to be still a prosperous and dominant portion of our government. Slavery, they have given up in the old form, but they want to subdue and keep in a low place the Negroes by some compulsion, which it seems to me they are trying to affect not only privately, but by all the legislation that I learned of or witnessed. A tax commissioner was asked, if they could have their way, would the rebel people generally remain in the union? The tax commissioner answered, no. I think they have a stronger aversion and dislike of the union than when they seceded. That is what the 14th Amendment was aimed against, the Southern insurrectionist spirit that was still strong. John Bingham, a member of the Joint Committee, said, unless you put them in terror of your laws, made efficient by the solemn act of the whole people to punish the violators of oaths, they may defy your restrictive legislative power when reconstructed. John Bingham wanted to invoke the terror of our laws to punish the violators of oaths. The historian's brief says, Bingham and his colleagues did not intend it as a political measure to fit their historical moment alone. This legislation will be felt, he said, by generations of men. Thousands of members of the Confederacy believed that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applied to them and was self-executing, and they proved that belief by sending petitions to Congress asking for the ban against them holding office to be lifted by a two-thirds vote of Congress. The historian's brief says, by 1872, Congress estimated the number of petitioners at 15 or 16,000. The newspapers at the time were full of articles expressing gratitude for Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, preventing Jefferson Davis from ever becoming President of the United States. The historian's final line of their brief says that the authors of the 14th Amendment knew that no one in the United States is above the law, not even the president, and that no Republican government can afford to return insurrectionists to office. It is Wednesday, the 31st of January of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, our little Yorkie, is the door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special... Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid us of these meddlesome priests? Will no one? Yes, okay. Taglines are out of the way, and here we are, ready to go. Raring, as we like to say. Hey, uh, Precious is, uh, I want to say that she's on the mend. I, she might have got into something, who knows. Uh, but I was, uh, as you know, a bit worried. But uh, she seems to be back to her old self. Uh, she didn't eat all the food. She's gotten rather picky. She'll eat something and, you know, lap it all up and the bowl will be cleaned. And then then she tires of it and then you find something else to get her. And, I, you know, that's how our pets train us. Just so you know. Regardless, uh, she was bouncing around and uh, going to greet people at the gate when they would come and saying hi to the kids as they walked to school and and the kids love her because, you know, she's such a cute little thing. Just she's precious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, now to verb. Anyway, um, uh, 
that did my heart well. But uh, she's also, I can tell, getting a little bit old. And she's not that old. You know, she's only like seven. But in, I guess that can be old. Our previous little Yorkie poo, Ginger, well, she was born in 2008. And so she was, yikes. That's right, about 15, 17, yeah, over 15 years old. Worked out to be about 17, I think, is what it turned out to be. That's an old dog. I had, you know. But when they're small like that, they're, you know, treat them like puppies. But uh, so that is some good news in the uh, maelstrom of whatever it is that we are forced to live in. And I often imagine, you know, it could be a lot worse. We could be, you know, life forms on the level of, I don't know, there's a lot of frogs out in the creek right now. Because it's getting to be that time of year, kind of warming up. And boy, talk about a dog-eat-dog world in the frog world. Jeez, if you can make it past the tadpole stage, that doesn't mean you're safe from other frogs. Jeez. And the more there are, the more food there is for the other frogs. So it could be worse. We could be living in the land of monsters that, uh, I got to tell you, seem a lot worse than what we are, except... How we ascribe malevolence. (laughs) Do those monsters, do they have really malevolent intent other than the fact that, you know, a meal is a meal? Heck, we walk down the pathway. Oh, look at that flower top. I'm going to eat it. No one thinks twice. Plants have feelings, too, just so you know. (sighs) All right. So, I don't know why we got on that tangent, but it is in the morning here on the West Coast, and that's what we like to do. But anyway, I I just like the fact that our little our little Yorkie, our Yorkshire Terrier is feeling better. That's good. Okay, and that's not to you know take anything away from Gunner, the English Bulldog, because. He's such a lovely guy, too. The kids love him also. They love both dogs. They're like Mutt and Jeff in a way. That's how old we are, because we know what Mutt and Jeff is. We know a lot of stuff. Oh, boy. You know what they say, the older you get, the wiser you are, and that's got to be ascribed just to the fact that we, we made it. We made it. Okay, well... What else is happening in the world? I I don't want to mention Trump because there's too much of Trump in the curated part of the show. But it is delicious to find out that it looks like he's uh, looking for some uh, newer legal counsel since Alina cost him 83, 85 million bucks. He's blaming her. Okay. And there's a lot of blame to go around concerning her. But. That's not the end of it. You know why that jury hit him with that amount. Because he is scum. He is scum. He didn't have to show up. He wanted to because it was the PR aspect. Because he's a natural. Carnival barkers are naturals about the media, I guess. Anyway, he's looking for legal counsel because, well, not too many people can go in with a $5 million judgment against you and bump it up to 83. Not too many can do that. But uh, he also blamed his lawyers and accountants for the casinos going bankrupt so many times that the Italian mob in New York stopped giving him money. And so then he had to launder Russian mob money through his overpriced properties. We all know that. He's a mobbed-up Russian money launderer and has been for some time. You can track it to the 
failure of its casinos. And why was that? Who can bankrupt a casino? The casinos are supposed to bankrupt you. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they're there for. You can't beat the bank. And the bank means the casino. Unless there was some sort of, uh, shall we say, creative accounting going on. And he was... Yeah, he was he was like, you know, lifting a little bit off the top, a little bit out the middle and a lot out the bottom, too. Because he's a bottom feeder. Yeah, he likes to gild everything and make him seem like he's in the upper echelons of polite society. But polite society doesn't gild. I know. I've served, I've served, uh, you know, many a meal and many a cocktail and wood paneled environs and they don't guilt. Not the real money. <laughs> okay. Just so you know that here in America, we don't have like casts or class. At least that's what we keep telling ourselves. Okay. So the world is also up in arms about the influence of a Taylor Swift. And no one ever thinks about, well, heck, if you can make people go and, like, I don't know, have a riot at Target trying to get a beanie baby. Remember those days? Cabbage Patch dolls. People were, like, shooting each other over Cabbage Patch dolls because you got the last one. It's not fair. Uh, pet rocks. Who needed a pet rock? No one. But you had to have it. How could they tell there was whether there was like counterfeit pet rocks? Well, it's kind of like what happened, isn't it? The counterfeit pet rocks flooded the market. Had to go back to just being gravel. Yeah. They create a product that you don't need, but you got to have it. And then they try to tell us, oh, brainwashing doesn't work. What? <laughs> That's part of brainwashing is convincing you brainwashing doesn't work, but you got to have a pet rock. And you don't know why, <laughs> but you're willing to kill for it or be killed. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, are you shocked that maybe an influencer like Taylor Swift, who might influence for good? Because what is wrong with voting? Why is it the knee-jerk response from MAGA is that if people vote, they're going to vote against them? <laughs> what are they doing that makes them think that people hate them so much that if you let more people come into the... Uh, I don't know, the town hall, they're, 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 they're going to do the thumbs down. What is it that they're doing that really people hate? I'm being rhetorical because we can pretty much tell what that is by the curated part of the show. And why don't we tell you what that is? Because, oh my gosh, yeah, we should. Every now and then I look at the clock. Every now and then. Well, starting off in the Bistro Cafe. Yeah, that was Lawrence at the top. I I don't know what is happening to MSNBC other than what we've known what has happened to MSNBC you know, for quite some time, even before the lack days. And I'm having a hard time watching these shows. I really did. Ari yesterday put up that Bernie conspiracy about, oh, the DNC, the Democratic Party conspired to keep Bernie from rising to the upper echelon of the heights that he so richly deserves. Yeah. Sorry. And then the readout, I gotta tell you, is on the outs here. Yeah, I don't know. I'm getting, well, I'll look at joy after the fact. I gotta tell you, there's no joy in Hitsville anymore. Eek. So, uh, but Lawrence, I can watch Lawrence. I can. And so uh, that's why we had him at the top. And it is just as I specified here in the show notes that the Supreme Court really needs a professional historian and not the amateurs that are there now. Okay. And I mean, 
MAGA justices and their clerks. I bet you, though, that the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society will all insist, oh, we have professional historians. We pay them well to tell us what we want to hear. Oh, really, do you? On the rest of the menu, the Texas Supreme Court temporarily halted depositions in the whistleblower case against Attorney General Ken Paxton just hours after Trump called on that court to end the case. And they don't specify why they say that, nah, you know, no depositions for that guy. An Arizona lawmaker who was a fake elector for Trump has introduced a bill that would allow members of the state house to overturn future election results that they don't like. I keep telling everybody the insurgency continues. And the court and other systems in George's Fulton County were hacked. But the district attorney's office said the racketeering case against Trump is unaffected. That's because Fannie is smart. She's got paper backup. You just know she's the kind that would. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the European Union Parliament is investigating a Latvian lawmaker after allegations that she spied for Russia. That's going around, too, you know. And a Thai court convicted a prominent political activist of defaming the country's monarchy and sentenced her to a two-year suspended jail term. It's kind of good and kind of bad. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so. Across the page to the left from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page, and if you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance. If you could afford to send us uh, those funds once a month, thereby you know, buying us an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, uh, we are able to pool those funds with other like-minded folk, and that puts a big dent in our bill payments, which we pay, and we have found that if we pay our bills, we are able to somehow fly under the radar and continue this powerhouse of resistance that has been resisting powerfully for many, 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 many years. And we have you to thank for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended. All those many, 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 many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, Facebook, etc., 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 you can do so by going to at Netroots Radio, or in some cases, just simply Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of those, and uh, we all take care of Facebook. So if you see us on Facebook, it usually says that it's us. It's who we are. But nonetheless, Tom takes care of the social media feeds, and we thank Tom for doing that, and also Kelly for doing everything that they both do. Thank you, guys. You can also follow me on all those social media platforms and more, too, Tumblr, Instagram. Oh, my gosh. But uh, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime, so therefore you have easy access to the actual articles by the actual reporters because that's important. You can also follow the show on Twitter, such as it is at Cookbook West, and please do pick up podcasts. 
by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Audible. We're on Audible now. Even on, uh, even over there on Amazon. We're on Amazon too. You can pick us up on your car. Anyway, uh, do pick up podcasts or listen on those podcast platforms as you would, and that would be nice. So thank you. And uh, let's see. I guess that's it. That's it? Is that all we do now? Okay, maybe it is. Maybe that's all that we do now. Let us tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fine smothered Benedict Wednesdays. And it is by the staff of the Texas Tribune. The Texas Supreme Court has temporarily halted depositions that were scheduled to begin tomorrow, Thursday, in the whistleblower case against Attorney General Ken Baxton. The all-GOP court issued an order on Tuesday staying the depositions and giving the parties until February 29th to respond with their broader legal arguments. The decision was made public within hours of Paxton's top political ally, Donald Trump, calling on the court to end the case. The Supreme Court did not elaborate on its decision to stay the depositions. Lawyers for the whistleblowers emphasized that it was not a ruling on the substantive argument by Paxton's office. This was not a ruling on the merits, and we look forward to continuing the fight for justice in this case to whistleblower attorneys Tom Nesbitt and T.J. Turner said in a statement. The people of Texas deserve answers from Ken Paxton. Well, so does the United States. Earlier this month, a district court judge in Travis County had ordered Paxton and three top A's to sit for deposition starting tomorrow Thursday with the Attorney General himself. Paxton's office fought that order up to the Supreme Court, asking the justices to at least put the depositions on hold. Well, the kicker was when Donnie said to do it, and they did. Is that in this reporter's opinion, or are we just reporting the facts? Hmm. Well, four former top deputies filed the whistleblower suit in 2020, alleging that Paxton improperly fired them after they reported him to the FBI for abusing his office to help a wealthy friend and donor, Nate Paul. Their claims were the basis for Paxton's impeachment by the Texas House last year, and he was acquitted by the Senate after a trial in September. In a remarkable move earlier this month, Paxton sought to stave off the depositions by announcing he would no longer contest the facts of the case and accept any judgment. But it did not sway the whistleblowers who have pressed forward with seeking the depositions of Paxton and the three aides, Michelle Smith, Brent Webster, and Leslie French Henneke. The two sides are due in Travis County Court today, Wednesday, for a hearing on Paxton's motion for the judge to enter a judgment. Justin Rorlick of the Daily Beast brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Yes, it is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. An Arizona lawmaker who signed on to be a fake elector for Trump after he lost his bid for a second term has introduced a bill that would allow members of the state house to overturn future election results that they don't like. The bill formerly known as Senate Concurrent Resolution 1014 and sponsored by State Senator Anthony Kern, seeks to bypass the popular vote altogether. 
It is the responsibility of the Arizona Secretary of State to certify elections, including elections for President of the United States. But the sole authority to appoint presidential electors is granted to the legislature, the four-line bill reads. Therefore, it concludes, the legislature and no other official shall appoint presidential electors in accordance with the United States Constitution. Is that what really what it says? Hmm. Giving the legislature absolute power to control Arizona's electoral college votes, regardless of who won the popular vote, would disenfranchise millions of Arizonans, do you think? <laughs> Kern did not immediately respond to requests for comment left with his office on Tuesday yesterday because, like I keep telling everybody, who does? That's telling him, not asking. A Minnesota native, Kern says his, in his official bio that he had a heartfelt desire to serve in the military during Desert Storm, but being a single dad and raising two sons at the time, he was unable to. I really wanted to, but I didn't. He has a degree in business administration and is self-employed because, (laughs) okay, I went to business administration. I have a degree. Really? From Heald? Hmm? Where else? Yeah. And he believes in entrepreneurs, this is according to his bio, and owned a private investigation business. Oh, really? And when you look at the guy, you can tell, yeah, he's he'd be a constitutional sheriff if he could get a chance. And he started the City of Phoenix Employees for Christ organization in 1995. You know, the kind that likes to put their Bibles on the dashboard for everybody to see. Okay. I sometimes looked at it as like a threat. When you see people driving around with gun racks and the guns or a baseball bat in the rack, when they put the Bible on the dashboard also, yeah, it's a threat. Now, a former code enforcement officer in the city of El Mirage, oh, yeah, Kern was fired in 2014 for lying to a supervisor about a lost tablet computer. His name was added to the Maricopa County's Attorney's Office's so-called Brady List, a database of police employees with known credibility issues that same year. Kerr later tried unsuccessfully to get his name removed from the list, only to be outed for the brazen attempt in a Phoenix New Times expose. Paisley described Arizona's Republican caucus, and that's the person in a previous uh, paragraph that I skipped. But he's uh, he's part of the Democratic uh, group up there or down there or over there in Arizona. He described the Arizona Republican caucus as a hotbed of MAGA extremism, and Kern has made no secret of his affinity for the case. He attended the January 6th. 2021 Stop the Steel rally and the subsequent Capitol riot. It was an insurrection, not just a riot. Although he has not been accused of entering the building and allegedly used campaign cash to fund his trip. Solidly Team MAGA, Kern says on his campaign page for his current congressional run. Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
Officials said court and other systems in Georgia's most populous county were hacked, interrupting routine operations. But the district attorney's office said the racketeering case against Donald Trump is unaffected. Fulton County, which includes most of Atlanta, was experiencing a widespread system outage from a cybersecurity incident since the weekend, County Commission Chair Rob Pitts said on Monday in a video posted on social media. Notably, he said, the outage is affecting the county's phone, court, and tax systems. But the Office of Fulton County District Attorney, Fawny Willis, said the racketeering case against Trump and others is not affected, and she said that yesterday, Tuesday. All material related to the election case is kept in a separate, highly secure system that was not hacked and is designed to make any unauthorized access extremely difficult, if not impossible, Willis said in a statement. Oh, you mean they're in a file cabinet locked up with a guard and other types of security, I bet. But the prosecutor's office said its operations were being drastically affected by the electronic court filing system outage. Visitors to the website that houses Fulton County's online records were greeted by a message saying it was temporarily unavailable. Additionally, the statement said the Atlanta Police Department was not sending emails to or opening emails from the district attorney's office out of concern for his own systems. That was hindering prosecutors' work because about 85% of their cases come from the Atlanta police. Hmm, I wonder who else would know that. The outage was reported to law enforcement and is under investigation. The FBI office in Atlanta confirmed that it was aware of the breach and has been in contact with the county's information technology department, but declined to discuss specifics. I bet. Okay, let us get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, dark fun. Driving home the night the nominees were announced, I heard a pundit say, there are Oscar-nominated films and then there's poor things. It's a safe bet you've never seen anything like Yorgos Lanthimos' adaptation of Alastair Gray's 1992 novel. This one might be the most bizarre coming-of-age slash road trip adventure ever. Set in an alternative Victorian London full of bizarre what-if technology and biology, a design known as steampunk, our protagonist is Emma Stone's character, Bella Baxter, who is, avoiding spoilers here, what we'll call a composited being, created by a Frankenstein-like Dr. Godwin Baxter, known as God for short, really, who's brought off by William Defoe. Okay, slight spoiler, Bella has the brain of a child, and the film is basically her growing up, physically, intellectually, and sexually, especially after escaping from God and his assistant and her betrothed Max to go on a steamship cruise with God's debauched lawyer, Duncan, Mark Ruffalo. On that cruise, she's confronted on every level imaginable, and watching her development is as fascinating as it is funny. In an amazing acting job, Stone captures Bella from untoilet-trained woman-child to sharp-witted intellectual discussing human perfectibility. The movie shot in black and white, with some scenes in color, lots of bizarre angles in the use of wide-angle lenses, seemingly unnecessarily, until you know the code. Poor Things ventures into fraught areas of feminism and female empowerment, where those searching for hypocrisy and outrage seem never to be at a loss. Those so inclined should remember that part of humor is satire and even cynicism. Fans of Terry Gilliam and Wes Anderson will get this one. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with 
with us at take2moviereview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. If you came across someone struggling with hunger, how would you recognize them? By their clothes, their age, the way they speak? Would you notice an eight-year-old girl who's not, not excited, excited for, for summer break? Because she may not be having lunch again until September. Or a single father of two who works three, three part-time jobs and still can't put enough food on the table. Or maybe a mother who cleans offices at night. Hoping to find meeting leftovers to take home to her hungry family. Or a war veteran who's it's having a hard time, time landing a job and getting back on his feet. I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. People you pass by every day but never knew were hungry. I am hunger in America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America, 200 Food Bank Strong, and the Ad Council. Don't you wish your life came with a warning app? Stop. That dog does not want to be petted. <laughs> A heads up before something bad happens. You should not send that text. Uh-oh. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome, but prediabetes does. With early diagnosis and a few healthy changes, you can reverse prediabetes and prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. To learn your risk, take the one-minute test today at doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to netrootsradio.com, Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. While we wait for the U.S. Supreme Court to rule on former President Trump's appeal to the Colorado 14th Amendment ballot eligibility decision, we have updates on other recent state cases. In Massachusetts on January 29th, the state's ballot law commission ruled against two challenges, saying that the body did not have jurisdiction. In Maine, a court kept Trump on the ballot after the Secretary of State's decision to remove him pending the U.S. Supreme Court's appeal in February. An Illinois Board of Elections hearing officer said Tuesday that the Board of Elections can only rule on Illinois election code matters, not the U.S. Constitution, and recommended dismissing the case. But Capital News Illinois reports that the judge also said that if the board chose not to dismiss, quote, President Trump engaged in insurrection within the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and should have his name removed from the March 2024 primary ballot in Illinois. States having already dismissed challenges include Washington, California, Michigan, Minnesota, Oregon, and New Hampshire, some of which could be reconsidered based on the outcome of the Supreme Court's decision. Ten more minor cases remain pending. Several others have been withdrawn by the plaintiffs, according to Lawfare. We have links to more information on these challenges at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Veal. Follow us on Facebook at AmericanDemocracyMinute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1992. That was the day the gravediggers of Chicago ended their 43-day strike. The United Press International's headline declared, The dead will rest in peace now that Chicago-area gravediggers have reached a tentative contract. The gravediggers were part of Service Employees International Union Local 106. The strike started on December 20th when workers at four Chicago area cemeteries walked off the job. At issue was wages, overtime, and health benefits. 22 other local cemeteries then locked out their workers. With the gravediggers on strike and locked out, more than 1,000 burials were delayed. The Chicago Rabbinical Society was able to get a court order for some of the burials to go forward due to Orthodox Jewish practice that requires burial within 24 hours. By the time the strike was settled, 
300 burials were still waiting. Unless there is a labor dispute, grave digging is work that does not often find itself in the headlines. It is one of the many unsung types of labor that it takes to keep a big city like Chicago operating. In 1974, the famous radio host Studs Terkel published a book based on oral histories he had conducted with working people over the course of three years. The title of the book was simply Working. The book featured interviews that ranged from jazz musicians to pharmacists, farmers to welders. One of the most poignant interviews was with a grave digger named Elmer Ruiz. Ruiz said, I usually wear myself some black sunglasses. I never go to a funeral without sunglasses. It's a good idea because your eyes is the first thing that shows when you have a big emotion. Always these black sunglasses. For accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 59 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs of only in the upper 50s, so we may be a little bit warmer than that. We'll see. But we do have a huge bank of rain headed our way. Cloudy conditions at the moment, expecting uh, about three quarters of an inch to an inch of rain with winds out of the south southeast at five to ten miles per hour we are currently under an active high wind warning though we are somewhat protected in our little protected valley here in rogue river uh it is quite blustery though at the moment as i went outside just to check Rain showers this evening with overcast skies overnight, expecting about a quarter of an inch of rain overnight. Lows in the mid to upper 40s and winds, they say, will be light and variable. And then increasing clouds in the morning with showers arriving sometime in the late morning, bringing with it about a quarter inch of rain. Highs in the mid to upper 50s, winds light and variable. Pollen is rated as none here in this little hamlet of Rogue River, Oregon. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 40 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is low at level 2. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.52 inches, visibility is up to 10 miles, and relative humidity is at 65%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the Weather Underground. London is 50 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 48 degrees and partly cloudy. Rome is 55 and sunny. Bagram is 29 and clear. Kiev is 38 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 70 degrees with light rain. Tokyo is 50 degrees and mostly cloudy. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 64 degrees and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 61 degrees and mostly cloudy with an active gale warning. You don't see that very often. Chicago, Illinois is 40 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 40 degrees. And New York, New York is 40 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources 
from around the world. Lauren Cook and Jerry Tanner of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. The European Parliament has opened an investigation into news reports that a Latvian member of the Assembly has been working as a Russian agent for several years. The president of the European Union's legislative body, Roberta Metsola, takes these allegations very seriously, her office said in a statement. Metsola is asking a parliamentary committee that handles the code of conduct for EU lawmakers to handle the case. Russian, Nordic, and Baltic news sites reported on Monday that Tatiana Zonoka has been an agent for the Russian Federal Security Service, or FSB, since at least 2004. Following a joint investigation, the independent Russian investigative journalism site The Insider, its Latvian equivalent Re Baltica, and the news portal Delphi Estonia, as well as Swedish newspaper Expressen, published a number of emails they said were leaked, showing her interactions with her handler. Expressen claimed that Zonoka spread propaganda about alleged violations of the rights of Russians in the Baltics and argued for a pro-Kremlin policy. In the EU Parliament, she has refused to condemn Russia's attack on Ukraine. Metsola also plans to discuss the case with leaders of the political groups in the parliament today, Wednesday. Sonoka is an independent member of the assembly and is not aligned with any of its political groups. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Staff at the World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Thai court convicted a prominent political activist of defaming the country's monarchy earlier today, Wednesday, and sentenced her to a two-year suspended jail term under a controversial law that criminalizes any perceived criticism of the royal institution. Pat Zavarali Tanakit Bevolpalin, better known by her nickname Mind, thankfully, had pleaded not guilty to an offense under Article 112 of the Criminal Code relating to a speech she gave at a rally in the Capitol in March of 2021. A judge at the Bangkok South Criminal Court officially sentenced sentence her to three years in prison for the crime known as Les Majest, but reduced it to a two-year suspended term due to her cooperation. She was acquitted of a charge of violating an emergency decree in public gatherings, but she was not an organizer of the event. A small group of supporters handed flowers to the 28-year-old before she entered the court. She was one of a new wave of leaders who took a prominent role in the series of unprecedented protests that shook Thailand beginning in 2020, calling for reforms in the monarchy. 
The institution is traditionally deeply revered and is protected from criticism by the Les Majest Law, which imposes severe penalties on those found to violate it, including up to 15 years in jail per offense. But agitation for a more liberal atmosphere surrounding discussion of the subject has grown since the death of King Bumibol in 2016 and the ascension of his son, King Maha Vajiralongkorn. The conviction came on the same day that Thailand's constitutional court is set to hand down its verdict in a, in a case against the political party that won most seats in last year's election over its campaign to amend Article 112. The charge was that its platform was tantamount to calling for the overthrow of the system of constitutional monarchy. I think that's exactly what it means. And that also brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver